thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon on this uh, Friday afternoon. And we're uh, very pleased to have uh, Ken Graham uh, with us today to speak on Weather Ready Nation and evolving the NWS means involving, evolving how we lead, ever so true. And uh, I'd like to uh, thank Wes Browning and the uh, St. Louis WFO for uh, hosting uh, Ken there today. So, uh, Ken, it's all yours. Well, I appreciate it, John. It's great to be here. I appreciate the invitation. And apparently it's, I brought the New Orleans dew point with me. Um, I, you get out in the morning, it felt just like New Orleans, so I feel at home outside here with all the rain. So I appreciate it. This is a, it's kind of a different presentation. I'm more used to giving weather presentations or... You know, we, we have some leadership presentations that we do in the office. This one's a little bit different, and it's talking about how, how we're leading in a, in a weather ready nation and where we're going, how we're evolving. And the worst thing I could do is just, you know, do a presentation on all the accomplishments that we had, whether it's the pilot project or things we're doing in New Orleans, because, you know, you, you know, you guys are doing great things, too. Here in St. Louis and the offices listening in, you all have a long list of wonderful things that you're doing. So. I'm not going to talk about, um, you know, the specifics with the swerve or the specifics that we did in New Orleans. This is more about the evolution. And I think what happened was over the last six months, maybe the last year, just, just looking around the office and how differently we operate. It, it, you know, it could have been Deepwater Horizon. It could have been the pilot project. We just operate differently than we used to operate before. And that's what I want to kind of share with, with you all today. And part of it is the evolution. And I asked you know, anybody in the room here or watching, how many people, if I was doing this in person, I would ask, if you've had one of these phones, these Nokia phones, would you raise your hand? And I see some smiles and lots of hands going up in the room here in St. Louis. And a lot of us have, and I have a, a my old roommate from college, uh, Steve, he worked for Nokia in Dallas, and, you know, he's an engineer and did a lot of work on this phone. And it was interesting that um, when they were working on this phone, it was a success. And they had difficulty evolving. You know, I, I remember him telling me stories on the phone. We would talk, have long conversations about this. It would upset him beyond belief that he couldn't bend his coworkers and his company towards this, this newfangled equipment that they're building in the future. Maybe that's uh, you know, similar to, to this, um, going into the smartphone era. And numerous presentations by some of the new engineers about how we need to evolve, we need to go this direction. And they could get nowhere in the company. They could absolutely get nowhere. They, they did presentations. They did PowerPoints. They, they did everything in their power to, to tell uh, the higher-ups that this is the direction that we need to go. This phone's not going to cut it forever. And they were unable to, be, to get that active within their company. It was a tough time. So how many people, I asked the same question again a little differently, how many people have a Nokia phone today? And, and I, I'm going to guess that not too many hands went up anywhere, um, either here or in listening in. And the BlackBerry was there, and they had the same thing. They, they had trouble evolving. They really thought that little center wheel would keep on going forever <clears throat> when the rest of us were waiting on a, on a phone that you could actually touch the screen and move around, similar to this one here. So it, it's one of these things that you know we, we try to evolve, but it's not easy. It really is not easy. How about this? This is kind of interesting. Always gets a few smiles. Um, this is, of course, um, Radio Shack. And I want to tell you right now, this I remember these um, you know, in the 70s and, and even the 80s. It was my favorite store in the whole world. I could go into Radio Shack. I could spend hours looking at the equipment, the radios, the antennas. It was my favorite store in the world. And, and it's interesting how they were so successful and how what a struggle it was to, to continue into the future. Well, they have prettier, prettier places now. They look a lot better, but it really isn't about brick and mortar. It, it, it's not about you know, a pretty picture. It's about missions change and how we change business and doing it different. And I can tell you that my kids, the only, the, when they think Radio Shack, the only thing they can, they can relate to is that's that place with the cool remote control cars that, that we walk, walk by. That's the only reason that they'd be even interested in, in this type of store, which is pretty interesting. So, and, and again, I can ask the same question. How many people used to shop at Radio Shack and love Radio Shack, and how many people go today? And it's not today. So everyone in the room was more, more than used to, and you, and you may still go, but it's, it's not the way it was. You, you, exactly. They don't have the same stuff. So, 
you know, it's, it's one of these things that the missions didn't change. And there's more examples. You can come up with your own. Again, this whole <coughs> entire presentation is not to, not to, to say I'm any sort of expert. I, I tell you, I, just, it, it, I see it in our office in New Orleans, and I, I see the, the mission changing before our very eyes and us trying to adapt to that. So here's some others. You can see them. I mean, it's, I think these are examples of places you used to go. Um, on a frequent basis and, and probably places you don't go as much now. And you can think about how these missions didn't change. If you think about Blockbuster and, and going to get a, a videotape and, a, and eventually a DVD to adapt to streaming video was a very difficult thing for that, that company to do. Borders uh, with the books and go into more a digital format for a lot of these and Circuit City and others. Uh, that, that those whole concepts dated themselves and eventually were, were tough to go forward. And I have Palm and Atari. Atari was the greatest thing I ever saw in my life when I was a kid, and I have nothing made by Atari now. So um, very difficult to look at. So here, here's what I'm talking about. I really am talking about companies adapting. If you take back in 1955, there were uh, 400, listen to this, 429 of the original Fortune 500 companies are no longer in business today. And, and in, those original companies were in 1955, your Fortune 500, and that's amazing if you think about it. I mean, these, at the time, those were thought of as invincible. I mean, they're the biggest companies in our country and fairly invisible. So what happens to these? Well, I've already provided some of those examples. You adapt or you die. It, it's a very simple concept when it comes to um, companies, it comes to business, and I can also make the argument that, that it also comes to um, even look at federal agencies and how we adapt and look into the future. So what causes that? My opinion is I think companies build bureaucracy around their success, and it makes it really hard to change. So you build a very successful product or service, you build a whole lot of bureaucracy around that, and it ends up being where it protects what you already have, and it makes it very, very difficult to go forward because that Nokia phone was very successful. Better not change that. That's our bread and butter. <coughs> Those that help build that success often tend to protect their work. We're all guilty, myself included. If I do something that I, I find was a pretty good thing, it's funny how I become very defensive if anybody attacks it. It's human nature. Or, you know, if we want to go a different direction, well, what about that thing that I worked so hard on? And so that is a natural human component. And, you know, it's, it's something that I think a lot of us can, uh, can relate to. We've evolved. I mean, I'm not saying that, that we haven't evolved. When I kind of bring this home a little bit, you can, I just have a couple pictures in here and usually kind of takes us back in time, the different things that, uh, that we've evolved. You'll see teletypes, you see the old radar. Even in the upper right, you see the, the tables where we've analyzed maps in the old days. So we've come a long way. That's our original home, um, the U.S. Custom House in New Orleans. That's the place where uh, Isaac Klein was in charge of the office and used to write the warnings and hand them to the New Orleans Police Department police chiefs and also the fire department by hand. What, what a day. You'd write, write, a, write the copy of the warning and then basically walk it around and, and hand it over to the, the police chiefs in the city. And that's what used to, to go on. So we've, we've come a long way. When I got in the weather service, this is what it looked like. People remember that. It, was my, it, was the, it, it kept me warm in a lot of midnight shifts. I think a lot of people can, can remember that. So we've come a long way from uh, that piece of uh, equipment. So we're looking at where we're going with Weather, Weather Ready Nation. This was the kickoff of the Weather Ready Nation. We were lucky to host it at our office in January 2012. And, and you think about how we're all so ingrained in our communities. We sent an invitation out. We had over 1,000 people show up, wanted to tour the office. They wanted to see the new things. We had a news conference. And the, mo the most frequent comment that we got was, I have no idea. People had no clue what was going on in that building and how exciting it was. And we still get requests to, to do more tours. So uh, we're really waiting uh, to do that and get more people involved. But it, it really is about the people that, that we serve. And our job is getting tougher. I'm telling you, the physical science is tough enough. The social science of what we do is, is getting incredibly difficult because of, you know, social media has really helped us, but at the same time, misinformation can get out there really easy. And I have a list of quotes. I want to show, share these quotes that we have in our hurricane training that we give to our parish presidents and we give our uh, county emergency managers and other elected officials. These are actual quotes from not the public. These are actual quotes from decision-making officials, people that make the calls on evacuations, people that make calls on um, 
you know, moving assets to different locations and that sort of thing. These are real quotes. And, and listen to how difficult the job has become. So we have a, it's tough enough to have a hurricane forecast and what the impacts are, but this is what we're dealing with here. This is just a Category 1 hurricane. And as we all know on, on the phone here, the World Meteorological Organization is the one that comes up with the names for hurricanes, and they've never come up with a Hurricane Justa, and they never will. It is so difficult to be able to say, and this was in Isaac, Hurricane Isaac. This is not just any sort of hurricane. It's large and it's slow, and it's communicating those, those impacts. That right there was such a difficult thing to overcome, the preconceived notions. It is, and by the way, you, there's offices that can fill in the blanks here for tornadoes, floods. It applies to everything that we do in the Weather Service. It's never flooded here before. We, we've heard that a lot of times. And the reality is you just never were in a situation where it could flood or it has flooded before you moved there. Or in this, the situation with this quote, it did flood there before, but they built the houses after the last flood. And by the way, they're at three-foot slab to four-foot slab level um, and about 10 miles from Lake Pontchartrain in our case. So never flooded here before was a, is an interesting one. I've been through Katrina and Gustav. This is nothing. So there's a constant comparison to the last storm. Whether we're, like, today we're dealing with uh, flooding here in St. Louis, and you know I, I know there's people out there who well, I didn't think it was going to be this bad, or it's never done this before. I mean, you're going to constantly fight all these things in the, the social part of what we do. The next one's pretty interesting. Um, the, I saw the news break into programming. That GFS thing says it won't come here. We're living in an age that everything that we have for data is publicly available. So in a hurricane, we have the public and we have also the officials getting the, the model tracks on their phones, their iPads, they're watching them on television. Every TV station is doing analysis of the different models and looking at um, the comparisons. So what's going on here? Well, this is simple. People will shop for weather, and they will find the solution based on their Myers-Briggs score. In other words, whether they're a positive person or a negative person, they're going to go search for that solution that suits what they're, they're looking for. And we saw it over and over in Hurricane Isaac, and, and it's becoming a, a case for about anything. So I have one neighbor that's extremely positive, would search out the one model that took the hurricane to Florida and wouldn't impact Louisiana. I have another neighbor that's, that's, that's a pretty negative person, and he was finding the model that would destroy Louisiana. So it was, it was a fascinating thing. People were actually finding the solution that they wanted based on their Myers-Briggs score and taking action based on that. People are actually a little bit confused on what's real, what's not, and what's coming from a reputable source and what's not. That's new. And just looking at the, at, around the room, seeing if that's experiences here, I, I think that's becoming a, a bigger case, and, and it's pretty interesting. So I think we're all dealing with that, and it would be fun to have some more conversations um, related to that. So the rest of them are similar. You can read them. I don't have to go through them all. Um, comparing the storms of the past, like Hurricane Gustav, um, there's one here. By the way, you know, this one, my app has most of those lines way used to here. I like the one that says Clipper. Clipper's climatology is not even a model, uh, but if it's showing on an on a, on a app, then people think it's real. And by the way, this was for Tropical Storm Bill. That quote right there was on a television station in our CWA. The television person on the weekend said, there's only one model bringing Bill to Louisiana, it's the Clipper. So I've got work to do when I get back with that TV station to, to, to work on that. So this stuff, it, it never ends with, with the training. Um, so you can see the last one. I have a GIS map, finally something accurate. People a little bit confused, something beautiful with something accurate. And we just had our 100-year storm last year. And that, and that was a, we heard that a lot, I, I know, in Sandy. And, and to give you one last example of how difficult this is, and our jobs, everybody listening, our jobs, I, I believe, are getting more difficult, and we have a bigger challenge to communicate this, because this was a quote from Long Island during Hurricane Sandy. The person on Long Island heard from the mayor that Sandy would be twice as bad as Irene. That's okay. I mean, that's, that's good, trying to get the message out. The person on Long Island got six inches of water in Irene, and interpreted that message as, I'll get a foot, I'll be fine, and wouldn't evacuate, and the, and the water went to their second floor in Hurricane Sandy. Wow. Okay, so the messaging part of what we do is, is getting difficult. So as I reflect back, I, I, I really, um, <clears throat> I didn't realize this happened. It was just one of these things that we just kind of evolved our office. 
looking back to Deepwater Horizon to today, I wanted to, to share some, just some leadership thoughts on, on leading an office as we go forward in this weather ready nation era. And it is about relationships. It's about the whole office being involved. Everybody has to be involved. It's about trust, flexibility, and solid science. And, and by the way, none of this counts unless we have training. Training is everything. Everybody has to be involved. You can't expect um, anybody to go give a briefing um, without some sort of training. We, all, and we don't brief very well. We long. We think everybody wants the, every detail of the science, and that is, that is not the case. They want to know enough information to make the big decision. And by the way, those decisions are uh, life and death in, in a lot of cases. So let's go over these real quick. Relationships, earning your keep. And what I wanted to say about this, we were not welcome at the Deepwater Horizon Command Center at first. We, we knew we had to be a player. We were asked for information on the periphery. The emergency manager was begging for more information. We, we got down to, to BP with the emergency manager, and we gave a couple briefings inside the command center, and, and eventually, eventually with time, they saw what we could do. We had to earn our keep. It wasn't automatic. We had to get in there. We had to give briefings. They had to see exactly what they thought was important, and, and it worked. And, and as a result, they never wanted us to leave. So every boat, every plane, Nothing happened in that response without the weather forecast in this case. But we had to um, constantly um, try to earn our keep in that situation. And that's going to be the case for you all. You have to build. It's a lot of work. You have to build those relationships. And, you know, one example, working with the Department of Transportation, it was a casual conversation. We were talking about fog, and they said, well, we, we never used anything you all put out for fog. And I'm like, wow, okay, can we talk about this some more? They said, well, yeah, your criteria is way too low. By the time you put it out, we already need it on the highway signs in Louisiana. So, well, what do you want? Well, we want two miles instead of one mile or a half mile. So working with your partners out there, I'm telling you, um, absolutely amazing what you'll find out, how their criteria may different, be different than ours and how you can meet their needs. It's a constant effort and, and an example. I'm telling, I just want to give these real examples because I think it's important here. I, last year, I went to the Coast Guard in New Orleans. This is the, the big Coast Guard Admiral, and I saw their weather briefing. Every single slide was from the Weather Channel or something they could find on the web. So we did the briefing, and we were able to show them new things on the web. And one thing that they requested was they begged for a one-stop shop website for us to be able to them to be able to have information, them to be able to find it really quick, be able to show it during their briefings. And actually, we were, we were able, to, able to do that thanks to the office that I'm in now. And uh, Laura Konofsky here, she's the one that helped build us that website. And I have good news that I was there last week, and up on the screen was that website. Their daily brief for the Coast Guard in New Orleans is the website that Laura built for us, which is absolutely amazing. So in a very Highly unusual thing to do in the middle of a presentation. I do have something for Laura here. I have a certificate of appreciation and uh, for building that website for us. Uh, it was absolutely amazing. And this shows how we can share information between regions and offices. We, we in New Orleans will steal anything we can get. We, we, in this case, uh, Laura's expertise. But I wanted to give you something here, Laura, for all the help with the website. We have the one-stop shop that you all are doing in Central Region. I can tell you for a fact it is a hit. The state emergency management is using it. The Coast Guard is using it. Uh, Department of Energy is using it. It is, it is a huge hit. So I wanted to prevent, to get you the certificate of appreciation and also something from our office, also a cash award that I wanted to give you. So a little, little different here. So. Good job, Laura. Thank you very much. Yeah. How's that for giving out an award in the middle of our presentation? I'm not sure that's happened before, but anyway. Yeah. So anyway, thank you so much for your help. Smooth. That's incredibly, incredibly appreciated. But look at look at the graphic here on the screen. You have your own. This is not a New Orleans presentation. I really wanted to be more general than that. You have you have your own logos and your own CWA. Go find them. I'm telling you, this is the bread and butter for our agency is, is being embedded with your partners, um, being indispensable to them, providing what they need. This is critical for the future. I'm telling you, they're going to be in your corner. And look, if they're using you, then, then we, we're, you're doing something of use. You know, you're doing something we know people use. So you'll have your own list. Uh, the whole office concept is, is incredible. 
you can't do it alone. No one person can do it alone, especially. And I'm going to show you in, in some slides here why you, there's no way you can do it alone here. This is just a graphic um, really looking back at Hurricane Isaac. This is just the daily schedule in Hurricane Isaac. We operate differently. And it happened before, like I've already said a couple times, it happened before our very eyes. We didn't wake up someday and say, let's do it this way. We just evolved into it. And this is a typical briefing schedule that we have. And you can just go down the list. The left column is the actual briefings that we have in one day. And then we have the deployments on the right side. So you can see the briefings. There's Coast Guard, Federal Executive Board. Uh, the Unified Command basically is the governor of Louisiana. It's the Unified Command Group. Uh, the Mississippi Gulf Coast briefing included the the governor of Mississippi, the ports, the parishes, and that was just in, in one day. And that's not including a lot of the media interviews in between. On the right, deployed uh, people we have where they are, Mississippi, Louisiana, with New Orleans, those are all the deployed uh, folks. We have six to seven people deployed at any given time, and we're going to do it again. So we're getting out. Now, if you think, I've, I've already showed how difficult it is sometimes to interpret all the different information. If you're not eyeball to eyeball sometimes, in, in the big event, wrong decisions can be made and lives can be lost. So we've seen it several times, and we've changed to try to adapt to that, um, that concept. And I think it really is helping out. More recently, this screen, we have a, a situation awareness screen that scrolls through a lot of different graphics. This is an example, Friday, June 19th, just a day in our lives. There's an email update on severe weather. We got media interviews. Uh, there's briefings on the, on the Mississippi River. And we also have some deployments going on at the same time. So that right there is just an example. I do want to share the calendar for the office. And I just, just going through these, I, we're operating differently and we didn't realize it. And this is the calendar for office since April. And I just want everybody to scroll through. This is not bragging. This, all this is is saying we're not sitting in the office anymore. We are not sitting in the office. We're not hiding behind AWIPS. We're not just issuing the product and, and calling it a day. We are getting out of the office and, and doing exercises, deploying Navy Week. Um, you can see the different things, storm surveys, interviews. The next one, FEMA hurricane preparedness classes, we're teaching those, hurricane specials, uh, hurricane kickoffs, uh, a train derailment. So we're issuing spot forecasts for a train derailment in between everything. Entergy gas, uh, working with their staff and, and getting hurricane prepared, the, mar the marine industry, I'm trying to pick out a couple of those. And the Army, looking at their tabletop exercise, um, you can kind of see, oh, we had an oil, oil rig explosion on Breton Sound, just, just in between all this kind of stuff where we got to ramp back up and, and do some of that work. Um, so you can kind of see some of these. We did have some severe weather in between there as well. The Corps of Engineers, District Tabletop. Um, anyway, you can see some of those. Fire departments, by the way, just giving you some ideas. We hit the local fire departments and get them trained. They need to know where to get information as well. And the list goes on. Notice this, this is just the last, this is just since April. I can't do that by myself. The WCM can't do that by himself as well. This takes the whole entire office to do this. And if you notice, this isn't necessarily just hanging out at the mall handing out brochures. This is exercises. This is training. It's not outreach in the traditional sense of outreach. It really is training and getting out there with the drills for the Coast Guard and, and um, and others. So this kind of gives you an idea, idea of some of the stuff. And this was just since April, which I think is amazing. The next big leadership thing, I'll tell you, this is huge, and I believe in it so much. I am, I, I cannot even describe how fortunate I am and, and blessed I am to, to have the staff that I have in New Orleans. And I think a, a lot of the MICs feel the same way about their office. What an amazing group of people that I get to work with here. And I, and I trust them, and, it's, and it is through that training. It is through getting people doing the things that they want to do in the office. And you can see some examples of the, the things that we've been doing. I get out of their way, and I worked a set of mid-shifts so some folks could deploy over to the French Quarter Festival. And it's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's about putting people where they're strong and, and doing different things. You can see some of the folks in, in action here. And I tell you, here's where the trust comes in, and I don't even worry about it a bit. Um, somebody in our office right there at the top, the governor of Mississippi was speaking during Hurricane Isaac in a big news conference and got a question about weather, and Mike Efferson from our office was deployed. And on the top right screen is Mike Efferson that got thrust right into national television because the governor said, why am I talking about weather? Where's, where's the weather service person? You, here. 
and Mike was banned. He's uh, on national television. Not a worry. Why? We've done crisis communication training. We've done media training. We've done all the training behind the scenes with the entire staff to be able to pick this up. Not an issue for us. Okay, that's the kind of stuff that um, that we need to be thinking about. Uh, the interesting, the lower the lower left. Again, those PowerPoints. I can't describe how those PowerPoints are everywhere. Every EOC, that, that right there is the state EOC, and they're big screens as our PowerPoint scrolling. The PowerPoint is massive. It's a huge thing. And that PowerPoint is actually on uh, Laura's page that she created for us. We actually put the latest briefing on there. We're working up, we're still working on some, uh, trying to keep that as updated as possible. We're actually putting a group together. Should that be daily? Should it be weekly? We're trying to figure out how to, how to do that. So that's something that um, is coming up pretty big. Uh, the deployments. There's opportunities. Take advantage of those. Super Bowl was one of them. We were deployed in three different places with the Coast Guard, also with the city of New Orleans, and also right in the Superdome. That's, that was my seat in the dome for the Super Bowl. And if you notice, I missed the entire game because those people right in front of me wouldn't sit down. <clears throat> so that was uh, an interesting experience for me. And when I was there when the lights went out, which was fascinating, and everybody turned to me and asked if it was weather. And um, I stuttered for a second, then I said no. My entire role was five seconds in that, that blackout. But anyway, I'm, I'm okay with that. Um, what's, what's interesting about it was we were doing things they didn't know we could do. We were running plume modeling for, uh, for bombs that could have occurred. We, we were running plume modeling for what areas if a bomb went off could impact the Superdome. We were running those things for Department of Homeland Security, and it was valuable. Nobody else was doing that. We had a role for that that nobody else was able to fulfill. Um, so that was a huge deal. And let me tell you, from a Homeland Security perspective, you know, leading up to the event, maybe a bomb threat a week, and then a bomb threat a day, bomb threat an hour during the game, you had a bomb threat every few minutes from all over the world. So externally, you know, your uh, fire department, police department, they're scurrying all over the city working on these type of things. So that's the opportunity that we could jump in there. And it's not something that they're always going to come asking for. You've got to be aggressive. You've got to get out there and say, we can help you, and, and not wait for them to come to you because they don't know what you can do. If you don't self-market, they're not going to come to you and ask for this because they, sometimes they don't know what they want, and, and you've got to show them. So it's a subtle difference. Flexibility is a big one. Um, what I actually wanted to say about flexibility was you, you can really put people where they're comfortable. We, we hit, not everybody in our office is comfortable doing those briefings. That's okay. We, we have people doing the grids. We have people doing the warnings. We want people where they're comfortable. So, you know, ahead of time, find out who wants to do what. If we're going to do briefing, we can do briefing training. Uh, the cross training is always, always huge. And not, not, it's not a negative note. I'm just being real. You know the people in the office that you don't want briefing the governor. And, and that's not a negative thing. That's okay. Okay. So in a big crisis, whether it's a big tornado event or, or a hurricane, you've got to get people where they're comfortable and, and do that training ahead of time so you can have as many people doing that as possible. Here's just a clip of... Friday, April 10th, 2015, we were deployed to the French Quarter Festival, 730,000 people. We were deployed to the Indy Grand Prix in Louisiana with the Jefferson Parish Emergency Management Office. There was a barge collision, a collision at the same time. We were issuing spot forecasts, working with NOAA. The spot forecasts were going out every 12 hours. We had controlled burn forecasts going on. We had a slight risk of severe weather, and then the evening shift called in sick. Just the things that we all faced in, in, in a day. And just wanted to take a, a little peek at one day like that because it's interesting how busy um, it can get. That weekend, by the way, we had a tornado watch um, and weather. So it wasn't, we had all those deployments with weather, so it wasn't a, a sunny situation. With all those deployments and those activities, we had baseball-sized hail, um, you know, big storms, jazz fest, had private weather support. But it was so overwhelming that the, the private weather support, they were calling us very frequently for help because it was a pretty, pretty big event. Uh, the Gulf Zero Classic was going on, and the private weather support also calling us. And actually called the, called the event because of weather. Navy Week, we had our people deployed there. And the previous Navy Week, they canceled an air show because the seas on Lake Train were too high. How's that for things that we don't always see? And it, it doesn't quite make sense at first, but it does because if one of the – the airplanes have to ditch in the lake. That was the emergency situation. They have to ditch in the lake, and the Coast Guard vessels couldn't get to them because the seas were too high in this case, something we would have never guessed um, ever. 
and so you really embed with those you're serving, and it makes a, a huge difference. And by the way, interesting enough, the Jazz Fest forecast by the private meteorologist said the storm's way to the south, don't worry about it. Our tweet said anvil lightning possible, everyone at Jazz Fest should take cover immediately. Um, interesting in the difference there, and that's the storm that we're looking at headed into New Orleans. We don't always get them this pretty. They're usually QLCS, ugly things, so for us this was a, an easier situation. Big hail core, a lot of lightning in the anvil, and by the way, that's a picture of Jazz Fest while the concert was going on, and it's an am amazing thing that that didn't hit and it hurt a lot of people. Um, just an example. This past one, this is an old picture. This is just the, the recent past uh, Jazz Fest. Solid science is incredible. It's so important. Look, if you don't have solid, solid science, it's not going to take long for people to figure out the weather emperor has no clothes. So you have to have the solid science going to this or, or you're going to, you know, the wrong decisions are going to be made. And by the way, look at this. This slide represents the format that we have during deployments. They don't want the ZFP. They don't want your, the website in a lot of cases. They want formats that they're used to. The Navy has its own criteria and their own protocol for formats when it comes to briefings. We adapt our, our weather briefings to whoever we're deployed at, so whether the city's formats or the Navy's formats. It's deployed, um, <coughs> learning while deployed, those different formats has always been critical for us. So you can kind of see the difference in the different formats, and it really works when you're speaking the same exact language. Another example of Navy Week, take advantage of this in AWIPS 2. For those of you on the call with AWIPS 2, you could do rain, range rings anywhere and multiple range rings. So you have a big event, you can put some range rings on there, use that because you can actually tweet that out, talk about where the storms are related to that, that, that event sort of thing for public safety. And in this case, we get a six hour notice for Navy Week and the impending storm. And, um, Anyway, that, that was a huge thing, and they actually ended up uh, evacuating the people uh, for that. Just a few last things here, because I can ramble on together, together you know, for everybody here for a long time, and my intent is just to, just to throw some things out to get some conversation. That, that's the main goal here, and talk about it. So being in the game takes a constant effort. We have a new admiral in, in the Coast Guard in New Orleans last week. I briefed the admiral personally for uh, about two hours. Why the new admiral comes in, you got a new person, you get a new elected official, you got work to do, you got to get them briefed up on uh, on all the different uh, things that can get them when it comes to severe weather. So being in the game takes a constant effort; it never ends. How do you know when you get there? I don't know if you ever do completely. It's always work, but I can tell you these are things that help. I think you, I think you're going to know when you get there when you're not just the weather 411 that we've been. I think you're not becoming the weather 911 is where we want to be and you can fill in the blanks exactly what that, that may mean. When you're indispensable in your partner's mission, you know you got there. If they can't do their job without you, you're in business. And I'm telling you, if you don't give them what they need, they can go elsewhere, and they do all the time. It happens to us. We're unable to give an inundation map. or unable to give that. They go somewhere else, and they could be your closest partner. The state emergency manager told me Wednesday of this week wasn't exactly getting what they needed, so what they did, they went to another federal agency and got what they needed. That happened just this last week. And that's going to happen to everybody. This never ends. It's a constant battle to keep giving them what they need and uh, figuring out what that is. And it's not always easy. You also know when you're there where you're as busy on a clear day as a severe weather day. I'm telling you, it's busy. That's, that's something that um, everybody in our office knows. And we just had an all-hands meeting yesterday, and I gave out awards to, to our office, um, the same thing. We've been so busy that uh, I wanted to thank them for all the, the great work, and it's busy even in the off season, and I think that's when you really know you're, you've got there. So I really wanted to get into, if we have some time, John, just if anybody had any comments, again, I'm, this isn't the, you know, the, 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 the end to all end here. This is something that throws it out there and just how our office is changing. I'm not saying it's the best way to do things. It's how we are and how we've evolved, so I'm most interested in your um, ideas out there. So I will shut up now and listen, listen to, to what some folks have to say. Uh, thank you, Ken. Uh, if anybody has anything they'd like to share, uh, just go ahead and speak up. And in case you muted your phone, make sure you uh, hit star six again to unmute your phone. Ken, you just blew them away. Yeah, there's, there's, some, there's some here. If you want to ask them, I can repeat them. Mike? Mike? My first one is, is um, you showed a lot of great things on there, and for me, 
I'm, I'm excited about this road and our future in the National Weather Service. The thing that is worrisome to me is our staffing levels for each individual field office. You showed things on how everybody is involved and how many places you're trying to be on a given day. We can certainly want to do that, but I'll tell you right now, our office doesn't have the bodies to do that right now. Um, and I, I don't think we're alone in terms of other offices across the country. And, and, and that's not counting extra meteorologists, which I think your office has. Um, we're not even up to normal staffing levels. So that's a concern to me because, again, I, I'd love to see us go this route and, and get more and more involved, but it, it requires bodies. And I, I'll repeat it in case y'all couldn't hear it. The, the question was basically, um, you know, looking at the, the staffing level and how, how to be able to adapt to be able to do all these things. And, you know, during the pilot we had the extra bodies and we don't now. We're fully staffed at least, and we still have one of the ER mats. It's, it's one of those things that, for us anyway, it's become what we, what we make priorities. So if it's, uh, we're blending the models, we're not spending as much time um, in the grids. If, if it's a clear weather day, we're, we're getting into a situation that if we could free somebody up to go, we'll have one person handle the grids, or one of the management staff will cover so somebody else can go. It, you can't do everything, and we're not doing everything. Uh, there, there's, there's a long list of things that uh, we'd like to do. We, we, we turn down some requests to do things, so we're not able to do everything as well. So I think it's one of those things that we've, we've strategically thought about what, where we get the biggest bang for the buck. And then we try to have some efficiencies within. Um, if we can have, on a, on a, especially a clear weather day, if we can have one person handle it during the day, we'll try to free up some others to, to go do some other things, some webinars, some training sessions, and that sort of thing. But you're right, you can't do everything if you're not staffed for it. Um, but it's a matter of just, and that's why we don't hand out brochures with them all. I think we're strategic. If you, if you looked at that list, it was that exercise with the Coast Guard. It was the biggest bang for the buck type of thing. So it, that's a difficult uh, question to answer other than we just try our best with what we have. And uh, everybody's involved. I mean, if, if I cover a mid to get people out the door, I got it covered. Um, not that it's crazy real well, I'm still trying to formulate the question, but I was a little bit yeah, it's not the, it's equal parts relieved and unsettled by your discussion of putting people where they're most comfortable, relieved because you know no one wants to sit here and think about the enforcement doing something they really are uncomfortable doing. So by the same token, a lot of times you have to be uncomfortable for growth. And so, how has your office balanced that in a way that avoids pigeonholing people into something um, at the expense of growth for everybody? Does that make sense? Yeah. So the, the the question is, when you you place people where they're they're most comfortable, how do you foster an environment that that you can have other people grow that would get them into an uncomfortable situation that they could get through it and then grow towards that that uh, being able to do briefings and some other things. And how we've handled it is, I, I think you know, in, in a crisis we get people where they're comfortable, but that doesn't mean they're not doing some of that. So we've had situations where. We've, we've had people that, that need a little bit of work on their briefing skills. So what we do is we've been able to give them some, some, some briefings that may not be to um, the governor, but the briefing to the Coast Guard where it's a little more meteorological and they start getting comfortable with it. And I, and I think they, we've, we've seen people start there and then get to the level where they can, they can start briefing the mayor or the governor. So there is a gradual process for that. And the other thing that we do is the the webinar that we do is weekly. Well, I don't, it doesn't matter if it's severe or clear. We still do that webinar. Everybody's required to do that. So as a result, people are developing those skills every single Thursday at 2 o'clock. If you happen to get that shift, you're on, no matter your comfortability. And, and that's made more people comfortable because they start getting used to the webinar process as well. What's that webinar that you're talking about? I haven't heard of it. We do a weekly webinar with our emergency managers ahead of the weekend. And we do it, we, at first we were going to do it as needed if there was a weather day like you all are having today. And then the, the office thought was, well, let's get everybody used to it. Let's just do it every week. That way our emergency managers expect the briefing. We do it every single week. Um, if there's not a lot of weather, it's a five-minute briefing. It's a two-minute briefing, whatever it is. But it helps them because if there's, there's upcoming weather for the weekend, they need to know whether they need, they need to staff the EOC. So we do it ahead of the weekend. 
And uh, of course, if there's severe weather or hurricane, we do it more frequently as needed. But it, but in this case, we're we're really looking at um, doing it more frequently so people can really get used to it and, and develop the skills. And is it based just on uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, the, the, that weekend period? It, it's based on uh, the current forecast and when the next significant weather is coming. So if it's a week out or maybe longer than that, hey, looks like nothing's <coughs> going to happen, but 10 days out, it looks like we've got a pretty big front coming in. Uh, we'll concentrate on where the impact is. So that way, hey, you all are set until this is the next big event. But you only do it weekly. Yeah, or as needed. We can do it every day during a hurricane. Okay, because we actually entertain the idea of something like that. And then the question was, is how often do we do that? It's like, okay, so today is um, Friday, and it looks great right now, say, through middle of next week. Then by Sunday, change, things change, and it looks like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday is going to be yeah. more active. So that would be criteria to do another one? Absolutely. So we, we would tell them... We would tell them in that case that the question was if you know it's clear now through the weekend, but the next weather event maybe the following week, middle of the week. We what we'll do is give the briefing, talk about that event, and say, look, our next webinar. We'll send the email. It'll be in the emails that are sent out too. The next webinar could be Monday, could be Tuesday. We'll we'll give the emergency managers an idea when the next webinar will be. And there's lots of ideas. I mean, it's it's. All the offices listening have their own great ideas too. So the biggest thing is just trying to share with each other and find out those best practices. Anybody else on the phone have uh, any thoughts? You want to share something your office is doing? Hey, Ken. Hey. This is Robert. Hey. You might want to share. You might want to share with them the desk assignments that we do here. How it's different than most other places. The decision support, digitize. Yeah, even even back in the office, there's an evolution of the desk. You go back in time, you think long term, short term, you think about the different desk assignments that we've had. Really, the way we do it now is we have a, a digital desk. That person does the grids. It's, it's one person that does the grids. The other desk on, on the ship is a uh, decision support desk. That person, they, they still, they're, they're blending the models for the aviation. They're still doing the tap because we actually we actually consider the TAP as a DSS uh, product. So we actually think that's decision support for the airlines and uh, the airports. So that person does that. But they're doing the briefings. Uh, they're watching the radar. So they're really concentrating on the decision support. So that's the way we operate on a daily basis. There's a decision support desk. That person comes in knowing they're going to do decision support. That's the graphics on the web, um, any sort of uh, webinar, any sort of email that goes to the emergency managers, whatever it may be, that person's doing it. And we also have the, the public service desk. Um, in, in a bigger event, we have a high impact desk. That one will uh, help do the radar or possibly take over the radar duties as the DSS person is extremely busy with webinars and, and emails. You can have somebody else watching the radar. And I'm telling you, in the biggest events, uh, especially a hurricane, that's the time we mostly do it. We go to 12-hour uh, shifts and we have a coordinator position that basically is coordinating everything. It's really trying to um, help do the, the graphics, the, the webinars, trying to keep, uh, one of the biggest things is keep the information consistent because that's something that we pride ourselves on is, uh, and our emergency ma managers tell us that. They said, you know what, no matter when I call and who I talk to, it's the same message from whoever it is. That's important in the heat of the battle. So somebody's got to coordinate that message and uh, even internally with talking points in a, in, a, in a big event like Isaac, we had talking points circulating so everybody can kind of sing from the same sheet of music. Thanks, Robert, for us. Uh, Thinking of that. Uh, any other questions, either on that. the phone or there? Here's another one from from here. Um, so, where, if you were anticipating severe weather, and you just mentioned desks and positions, where would that fall? Would that be an additional staffing level on top of that? Yeah, it's it that would be additional staffing level on top of that, and we um, the the one slide that I showed that had the arrow with the different levels. Um, of DSS, we, we get in a situation that we're, and, and you can see the slides, the, the yellow and the, and the red zone, um, if I went back to it, but that's a situation that we actually bring extra people in. And with a big hurricane, we consider it actually uh, pretty much all hands on deck. And I'm going back to the slide now. This is the one here, if everybody can still see it. 
um, down at the bottom here. So all clear, nothing going on. I can tell you um, heightened impacts will probably have an extra person. That could be you know, an extra radar type person. When we get into high impact and full engagement, um, full engagement is all hands on deck. For a hurricane, it's all hands on deck. It's, it's, and the other thing that everybody has to consider, and I'm not saying that we haven't figured out yet, but the social media is becoming such a, a draw on time, but an important draw on time, that we almost have to assign one body to the social media. I don't know how we're going to do that yet because there's, the volume is incredible. And, and I know in southern region we're working on, and there may be some other regions doing it too, how other offices can maybe share those duties and help us in, in a big hurricane with the social media. So we're trying to figure out those type of things, but there's so much information that comes out of the social media, and it's such a great way to share information that somehow, and, and we're all trying to look into Skype, right? Everybody's starting to look at Skype, and so you're going to have to have, if we're going to do all that, you're going to have to have a body doing it, because you can't do it on the side. And, and once you start it, people are going to expect it. So um, that's something to consider in all of our severe weather plans. Anybody else out on the phone? You're all just jealous because Laura baked a fresh homemade biscotti and brought it in here for us. So uh, <laughs> if you all were here, you'd, you'd, get the, you'd get some of that. So. I'll have one final question, and that is the fact that your whole office is, is, is deeply involved in I'm going to get committed to this. Mm -hmm. It's a great thing. Have you had trouble getting that acceptance and, and, and that complete buy-in um, in order to do what you're doing? Yeah, I think um, hopefully our office is, is still listening and they could back me up on this. I think, you know, I think I'll just throw out some numbers and see if they have any comments. I think when we first talked about this, I think there was some pretty good buy-in, but definitely not everybody. So I would say... I would, I would make up the 30, 40, 50 percent range when, when we first got there, but deep water forced us into it. You know, deep water was a situation that we, we all jumped in because that was the right thing to do. And, and I think post deep water and post some of these hurricanes, I think our office has somewhere 70, 80 percent buy-in. I think the buy-in is high. It's just a matter of figuring out where everybody plugs into that type of thing, and that's not easy. So the, the reality of life is you may never get 100 percent. So the philosophy in our office is we, we've done this. We, we take who wants to go and we run. And then we, we find roles for everybody so we can get as many people involved with it. But um, we're pretty high. I, I think in our office, 70 80%. Um, but I don't know. If you guys are still listening, chime in on that one. But we're, we're pretty lucky in that, in that regard. So has it been an evolutionary process where is people who were involved in it more, they're like, they understand how valuable a um, role we play with our partners and their decision making. Yeah, and, and you get from like you have people in the yeah. office who had certain expectations when they went to the job, and this, what you're describing is very different. So yeah. what's the expectation for how do you get from here to here? I think the question was is, you know, people have the expectations when they come into the job, and that's the issue of the forecast and the warnings, and then how do you get to a level where we're doing the DSS and, and really with the emergency managers, and you know, our office, and, and I think a lot of places it's the same thing, the EMs are usually a pretty vocal group. And I think what happens is we've had emergency managers in the office. They've interacted, and I, I don't think it was, it wasn't this last station meeting. There was maybe last year we had a station meeting. We had a state director come in. The state director came in and thanked everybody for the event. It was incredible. So I think there's firsthand sight and communication and interaction with the EMs. That feels good. I don't care who you are. I don't care if you're only comfortable really doing the grids. When you have when an emergency management director or a state director or, or the media come in and say, we like what you're doing, that makes a difference. That's better than the MIC. The office should, you know, that's better than anybody saying, hey, we should do this. That's just a coworker. What do you know? What do you know, MIC? But when you hear that from somebody you serve, especially in the state capacity or, or a, a FEMA ca capacity, that means a lot. Does that make sense? then it's tangible. Then it's, wow, what I did made a difference, and they made this decision based on what I just put out. That feels good. Does that make sense? And it, it, it makes it so much more tangible. So, you know, the state conference or host some EMs here at the office, interact with them because they love you out there. And, and there's probably some things that you can, you can do with them. All of us can do more, including us, can do more with them. That's, that made it tangible, if that makes sense. 
Okay. Well, Ken, thank you so much uh, for being willing to do this for us, on a, especially on a Friday afternoon and everyone uh, there. Uh, Wes, thank you for uh, sponsoring uh, Ken to come in and hosting it there. And thank you, everyone. Wish you all a good weekend. Take care now.